Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Ask Me Anything for the CrossFit Lynchpin Private Track Facebook group. It is July 29th, 2021, and we're going to kick this off. We do this every Thursday. Members submit questions. The most uploaded ones get answered live every week, and so here we go. And obviously, I've got Emily here with me as well. Good morning. And so there's some gymnastics-specific questions, some new mom-specific questions, because we had our daughter about four weeks ago. Four weeks, ish, yeah. More or less. So the road to fitness is, is going. So let's see. Starting off with the first question was from Justin R. That was the most upvoted one. Let me scroll real quick and find the exact wording of the question. Um, here we go. No. Justin R. Here we go. All right. How to evaluate programming since it often requires blind faith. Uh, obviously, well, thank you, Justin, for calling me competent to programming. Uh, he's binging the podcast and enjoying it, so that's good. Check out Lynchpin Conversations. Obviously, you're listening to this. However, with other gyms I have gone to, you mostly have to put your quote-unquote faith in their programming system because you often don't have the 10,000-foot view to make sense of it all. If somebody is joining a you know brick-and-mortar CrossFit facility, how do they know the programming isn't just randomness? And how would somebody challenge or critique the programming to ensure it is going to help them progress? The challenging or critiquing the programming could be an interesting one. But uh, in general, yes, you're right. There is a certain degree of faith that is required in trusting programming if you're unfamiliar with, with programming, with um, all the little ins and outs and nuancy, big concepts and little concepts that go into well-rounded programming then, and most people aren't because it's a full-time occupation in and of itself, a full-time endeavor of study, which most people have other things that they're doing to earn an income, and so they have to rely that others who say they're competent in those fields are. This isn't unlike so many other facets in life, right? I mean, before we moved into our house, I'm not a builder. So I had to have a leap of faith that I guess the house was made well, beats me, um, looks good, the guy seems competent, other people uh, like his work. Same deal if you're taking your car to a mechanic. Again, there's a leap of faith. And, and whether it's the buying of the home, um, taking a car to a mechanic, whatever it happens to be, something which is outside your scope of expertise, programming is no different, I would seek out recommendations from people that you like, know, and trust that also don't have a vested interest in telling you that something's good or bad, you know, because they're a part owner or whatever, like an actual, real, unbiased opinion from somebody you think is level-headed and competent and has, you know, some sense in the matter, whether it's they've had their car, or, you know, gone to that mechanic or the friend used that builder or their experience with this particular affiliate. They've had somebody that's been there six, nine, 12 months and can speak to what's going on, that outside of you having the actual knowledge and expertise to uh, to look at several weeks or months of their programming and then do a real honest, unbiased assessment to make sure that they're hitting everything they should from movements to time domains to rep ranges to light to moderate to heavy, do they have any biases, et cetera, et cetera, a trusted, a trusted friend and recommendations would be um, one of the best things I can say. And you know, you've got all kinds of gyms and all kinds of programmers out there, right? And, and just, it is what it is. Before you become great at programming, you have to suck for a while. It, just like it's before you become a great chef, you're probably not doing well for a while. Like There's no shortcutting the way that everything develops in the world. If you're a novice programmer, you're going to produce novice level workouts for quite some time. And you're going to be there a while. Everybody wants to rush that process, but it just takes the time that it takes. And then you're going to be intermediate for what seems like forever. And then, you know, advanced programmers do what they do. But so, again, every gym is going to be on a different path. And you just have to do that assessment either based upon your own knowledge or the people that you like, know, and trust. Um, I had something else I wanted to hit on this, which is why I wrote things down and then I totally went off my notes. Yeah, Well, there are pitfalls that you can avoid. So first of all, if you're trying to find good programming, right, good can mean something different to different people. 
in my humble opinion, programming should be judged on one thing. It's efficacy. Results. Does it work? Period. And end of story. And there are a lot of fancy, shiny pitfalls that can try to get you to maybe think something is effective that really isn't from fancy, sexy media to whatever it happens to be. None of that matters. Results. Does the programming work? Which is why you have to talk to somebody who's been using it for 6, 9, or 12 months. Just because something looks fancy and complicated doesn't mean that it produces results, right? They can science you to death with the different phases that they're in. And ooh, it lures people in. We're in this phase now. Doesn't mean that it works. Could be total garbage. The opposite is also true, to be fair. You could have programming that is, you know, beautiful, you know, living your life in single, uh, single modalities, couplets and triplets, you know, trying to be elegant, so to speak. That doesn't mean that it works either. What makes good programming is whether or not it is effective. So don't fall into any of those, any of those potential traps. Um, I think that might be all that I had on that. So hopefully that helps. Anything, anything on that? <laughs> Why don't you take that one? <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, you know, programming is funny. It's one of those things where just because also somebody has been doing CrossFit for a while in no way, shape, or form means they know how to program workouts. It just means they go into the gym and work out every day. That's it. Just like I use a computer every single solitary day. I don't know anything about how a computer works. Absolutely beats me. Drive my car every day. I don't really know how my car works. So just because somebody has repeated exposure to something or they've been doing it for a quote unquote a long time, that doesn't necessarily transfer to competence either. It might, but not necessarily. So you really do have to do your due diligence on that. Okay. On to my wife here. Now, time for a, an Emily question. This one's from Melanie. All right, Melanie says, first of all, she says, hello. I've been tremendously impressed with the poise of Simone Biles for many years, but never more than what has happened recently. Did you ever imagine a day where a top gymnast could put her mental health above all else? Thoughts on the Simone Biles deal? Yeah. And I guess um, anyone who's unfamiliar with it, what are we talking about? What happened with so Simone Biles? She pulled out of the Olympics, essentially. She did the qualifying round and then did not compete with the team and has pulled herself from the individual all-around finals. And then we'll see if she does any of the event finals. She is a phenomenal athlete, a phenomenal gymnast, and what she went through was so heartbreaking. Um, and if you're not a gymnast, you just probably don't understand how real... That is, and if you watch the vault that she did when she was completely lost, you see her head trying to go one way and her body not really following along. I can't explain it. It happened to me. Well, that was, I mean, so that was the thing. Not only is she that great, but she apparently she she's, pulled out because she got lost in the air. Right. I mean, she's also a human being, and even the best of the best have their moments where... Um, you know, it just didn't go her way. And I think one of the things that happens when you're, she's been doing some of these skills for so long now, you're almost on autopilot and you don't really have to think about um, the finite details of what you're doing. Your body just knows what to do. And then every once in a while, you just, it just doesn't work. Um, and it happened to me uh, like two weeks before pac 10s, my senior year in college. It also happened to me when I was younger, but in that moment, um, you know, I was ranked number one on the uneven bars and all of a sudden threw myself into a dismount and, and had no idea where I was and came back down and landed just in a heap. And it threw me for a loop. And even two weeks later, I ended up falling at pack 10s because I still didn't have my stuff together. Um, and it kind of ruined the end of my, my career because... That was the end. I was a senior, and I just didn't have the time to work through that. So with her, too, because she does such a high level of skills, I think she is so wise to do what she did because her life was on the line. I mean, when you're competing at that level and you're doing... She does things that most people can't even fathom. Um, and so if she were to just power through, there's a chance she could have really, really injured herself or even landed on her 
head in a way that she could have killed herself. So um, also the amount of pressure that that woman is under, I can't even imagine. She has been the face of so many things. Uh, every commercial for the Olympics has had her on, on it, so she's kind of the face of the Olympics. And then she's also taken on this role as the only survivor of the abuse that happened um, you know, a couple years ago. She's the only one still competing, so she's kind of been the voice of that. And I, I just can't imagine the tremendous amount of pressure that she's under, as she kind of alluded to the day before. So it, it is awesome. And I think what else it does is it speaks volumes to the change that's happening in USA Gymnastics, that she gets to kind of stand there and say, gone are the days that you control me. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do and right now this isn't working for me and so I'm going to pull myself out and I think that's huge for you know all, all the coaches watching all the little girls watching that they actually get to take control of their own athletic career because she still has to live the rest of her life as a human being and no longer an athlete um, so I think that's very important. What was the name was it a book or a movie that you referenced that pretty girls and little, oh, little girls and pretty boxes I think that book was written in the 90s, I think, about kind of that era of, I mean, just massive amounts of abuse, physical, mental. Um, it didn't touch on the sexual abuse, but I mean, coaches withholding food um, from their athletes if they didn't do well. And that stuff certainly happened to me as well, but, but the tide has changed a bit. And it's nice to see the athletes in control. Um, and what else was really cool is that I think that everybody that competed was over the age of 18, which has never happened before. And obviously Simone was 24, and um, Michaela Skinner was also, I think, 24. She's married. Um, you know, she's planning to start a family when she's done. So the athletes are also getting older with it, which I think speaks to the volume of the sport as well, that it doesn't have to be this, let's burn everybody out when they're 8 to 10 years old. And yeah. So she said that she got lost in the air. She got lost in the air. Kind of didn't know where she was. And then one of the announcers said they called it the twisties. Yeah. Right? Which I had not heard it called that before, but um, makes sense. I get the twisties on butterfly pull-ups. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I just won't know where I am. I it's come a down very and take a break. scary, scary thing. You cannot just mentally push through. You want to do something, and your body just flat out will not participate. It's it's very bizarre. Well, I can't. I mean, it's a level of skill and athleticism that's basically science fiction compared to what I can do with my body. But I can't imagine sprinting across a floor as fast as I can, launching myself so high into the air, uh, flipping and rotating at the same time so fast that it's mind-boggling, and somehow... The gymnast actually knows where their body is when that's happening, I guess, so they don't crash and burn and die. And so if I, I can only imagine that all of a sudden being in the middle of that and going, I don't know where I am, would be terrifying, terrifying. terrifying. So, yeah, I can't, I, I can't even imagine that. Okay. Um, one more question for me than three for Emily. She's doing all the heavy <laughs> lifting today. It's fantastic. <laughs> Made for a very easy Thursday for me. Uh, this one back to me is from Kelly H. Kelly says she's making her way through the linchpin conversation. She's somewhere in the 120s. Awesome. I think this will be like the high 180s or 190 or so. You hinted at an on-ramp type program was coming. I don't think I see that offered yet, so I wanted to check in on the progress. So, Kelly, yes. Okay, there's there's three that will be coming. A body weight on ramp, so just you know, no gear whatsoever. A dumbbell on ramp, and then a barbell on ramp. The body weight is done. The dumbbell is done. And after the game's hecticness and craziness starts, sometime after that, then we'll get going on the barbell one. And then once all three are done, they will get launched, and that will be most likely not just through linchpin, but probably through beyond the whiteboard as well. So they're in the works. Two out of three done. They're in the works. They should be a fantastic resource for people. And I hope people enjoy them because a lot of time, thought, and energy went into them. And the other thing that you mentioned, Kelly, good on you for calling me out on it, 
is that you hadn't heard any of the linchpin shoutouts for a while, which traditionally at the end of the AMAs, I, uh, you know, take screenshots from the Facebook group of cool things that caught my attention. At the end of the AMA, I, I give a few shoutouts. I've just forgotten for like the last month or so, and if, every time I finish an AMA, I, I shut off the camera and I look at my desktop, and there's a little folder that literally says linchpin shoutouts, and I go, dang it! Forgot to do it again. So I have four of them open on my screen right now, and at the end of today, we'll finish with some linchpin shoutouts, because yes, we do need to get back to that. Okay. Back to Emily. This one is from Jin, and here we go. Okay. All right, here we go. Question. Emily, since you're a gymnast, uh, she says that I am afraid of being upside down. So handstands freak me out. I'm afraid I'm going to fall on my head. Handstand push-ups are not even a consideration because I can't get to first base. Do you have any suggestions that I should try to get this going in the right direction and get over my mental block? By the way, you're a hero for working out and doing great so close <laughs> after giving birth. So upside down problems, handstands. So it's very normal to be afraid to go upside down as an adult. I, I think you know, you're very aware of if your arms give out, you're going to hit your head and potentially hurt your neck or crush your skull. So that's a very normal um, fear. And yes, there are way, things that you can do, um, and uh, we can maybe make a video later, but basically treating you kind of like if you were a preschooler and it was your first progression learning how to do a handstand, doing the tiniest, putting your hands on the ground, doing the tiniest, smallest kick up, um, just to maybe even just get your feet an inch off the floor and then coming back down working on that so that you get even the slightest um, being comfortable just having some weight on your upper body and then kicking up a little bit higher and a little bit higher and a little bit higher. And I think one of the biggest mistakes that I watch CrossFitters do when they do handstands, especially if you're new and especially if you're learning, is that they put so much force into kicking up, they go over and that is never a place that you want to be. And I think some people are strong enough that they can figure it out, but some people are not. And that is absolutely not how it's taught in the gymnastics world. You always err on this side, never on this side, because this is where injuries are going to happen. This is where you can't catch yourself. This is where your arms are going to give out. And so learning to control your body here, then here, then here, I mean, in truth, you should never go over this way in a handstand. Um, that's why one of the things that when I first started CrossFit, everyone was doing handstand push-ups uh, with their butt to the wall. That wasn't allowed in gymnastics. Every time you did anything against the wall, it was stomach to wall so that you could keep a hollow body. A hollow body transfers over to most everything. An arched, messy position transfers over to nothing. Um, and so we just weren't allowed to train that way. And so that was a shift. And I can understand why you're, if you're doing fast handstand push-ups, why you can't maintain this absolutely perfect body position. But if you are learning a handstand, I would recommend that you are always going stomach to the wall and then starting very, very, very small and never putting so much uh, momentum that you're kicking over or even all the way up to handstand. You need to learn to control your body position, especially a nice hollow body, um, long before you're kicking your feet over your head. Does that yeah, make sense? Yeah, and, and I've got something that popped into my mind. Not a gymnast, by the way, so sanity checking on this as well, that maybe while that's happening on, happening, you could do something on the side, which is, uh, well, first of all, most CrossFitters bypass the steps that, Emily just said there. But then I have seen some people, kind of like you said, that have the lower body strength to kick up, right? But they have not yet developed the shoulder press or overhead strength to once they use their lower body to kick themselves up, their arms just collapse and they fall back down. So on top of everything that she's doing, a good you might have um, confidence if you know that you're quite strong pressing overhead and so that you know if you do get yourself to that position you unquestionably will be able to press and support yourself so 
Yeah, you I could would... even get into a box and put your feet up on the box and have your, your body weight over the top of your hand mm -hmm. and do small kicks from that position so that you can feel that weightlessness um, where, where all of your body weight is sitting on top of your hands, but you're not high enough that you're going to collapse. Um, or if you if your arms do give out, you know, you're just going to go down a little bit and the box will catch your, your lower body. Um, yeah. You know, in, in addition to what you said about in gymnastics, for handstand push-ups, it's never back to the wall, it's stomach to the wall. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I would think on top of the body position that you just mentioned, one of the other big factors is, I would think stomach to the wall means you're doing them strict. You're obviously not bringing your knees down and kipping. Right. Right. Where, right. So that's right. you know. I think so. I'm assuming that in classic gymnastics, you're not kipping handstand no. push-ups. You are. That's called cheating. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be sent back to rep zero. <laughs> you are doing strict, strict, strict handstand push-ups. So there's no need to have your butt against the wall because you're not bringing your knees down and kicking them back up and all that stuff. But I think one of the things with the Olympics on, if you're curious, go back and watch both the men and the women on the bars. Obviously, men do a different kind of bars, but when you watch them go up to a cast handstand you are rarely going to see a cast handstand. Well, you'll never see a cast handstand at this level that goes over. You'll often see them fall short and miss because they've trained so much to hit that hollow position, hollow position when, when their legs go up. Um, sometimes it's not quite enough and they'll miss an error on this side. You will never see heels going over. So it's another, if you're curious, watch. You know, let me get to Justin's question real quick here. Oh, uh, stand by, Honda. I've got something I don't want to lose in my head. Okay, so, Justin, I got your question called up. But what you just mentioned there potentially ties back, uh, we're about to get to Justin H's question, ties back to Justin R's question initially about analyzing programming and how it is a skill. It is a talent. It is, you know, it's a full-time occupation. And so you can look at it and it might look great, you have no idea really what you're looking at unless it's really what you do, you know, is program and analyze programming. And it's the same thing like when I watch the Olympics with her. I've watched somebody whip around on the bars or the beam and do a vault. And to me, it's all happening pretty fast. Well, it looks like they leapt into the air and landed. I think that's a success. I think some people might look at program and be like, I don't know, it looks good. But then I'll sit and watch the Olympics next to her, and I'm, I'm in my mind, I'm like, ah, oh, this person's crushing this. And then I'll hear next to me on the couch, ooh, that didn't go well. I'm like, what What didn't go well? Like, I just looked at the screen with you. I saw nothing. They're just whipping around on the uneven bars. But there's, again, like anything that's, that's complicated, there's so much little nuance that unless your eye is trained for what it is that you're looking for, you're going to miss it. And that's me watching gymnastics. So it's nice that I get to watch it uh, with Emily. Okay. Next, next one from Justin H. Justin asks, Emily, how do you plan on getting back into fitness? And do you have any advice for new moms? My wife is just starting up again after almost a year off. So my plan, well, I never really got out of fitness, if you will. I think that's um, a big point. Yeah, I worked out very consistently um, through my pregnancy. I think there was maybe only two weeks in there that I worked out less than four days a week. Um, now when you say worked out, you mean instead of Fran PR? <laughs> no. I should, and towards the end, working out, it, I was moving my body. Yep. Um, and so then I felt, I felt really good. About a week after um, Lane was born, I struggled. I was actually in tears because I know that it's said that you're not supposed to do anything for six weeks after you have a baby, but my digestive system wasn't working. My back hurt. My chest hurt from just simply being sedentary. So I told him, I was like, I know that this is what I'm supposed to do, but I can't sit here any longer and do nothing. It, it is causing me more problems than it is good. So I went out into the garage and started at about one week. Again, moving my mm -hmm. body, not working out. Um, I think Low my intensity. First workout was I did banded good mornings. Um, I did some cat and cow stretches and I did uh, ring, ring rows. rows. Yeah. 
very slowly at a quite a high incline just to get things moving. And within a week, I, I felt fantastic. So, so, so much better. Things started working again and um, the healing process actually started um, moving along much faster than it was. So that's what worked for me. And then by about week three, I was like, okay, I'm ready to start pushing things a little bit. But still being wise, like for example, yesterday uh, we did the running, mm -hmm. the pull-ups, and the sit-ups. I can't do the volume that was asked of yesterday. And I know that I, I could have, and I would have paid for it today. It just would have been very dumb. So I scaled everything way back, and even the first two runs felt great. But I felt like if I did one more run, because I had ran a mile, that was more than I'd run since I was like 16 weeks pregnant. So I biked the last one and everything else I cut in half. I hadn't been on the pull-up bar in a while. And so I went slow and chopped things up a lot. Um, and so I think, you know, you have to listen to your body and everybody is so different. And that's one thing that I, I will say I've gotten a little bit frustrated with even within the CrossFit community, is everybody thinks that they're an expert because they had a baby once upon a time. Pregnancy experts. And what's good for one person isn't necessarily good for another person. And I think you really, much like you know, doctors say that mother's intuition, you know your child best, you know your body the best. You know your body better than any physician. You know your body better than any internet pregnancy specialist. So listen to your own body, and, and if you've taken a year off, start slow. And I think we sometimes get caught up in working out and think it has to look and feel a certain way. Go slow. Just move your body and kind of change that mentality of moving your body is still a workout, even if it doesn't look the same as it did once upon a time, but you will get back there through consistency, and it just might take a while. Um and just don't compare yourself to anybody else. That's and, I, and even myself, I found myself falling into that trap. I remember when mm -hmm. I was like 29 weeks pregnant, I think somebody in the linchpin group around the same time ran a half marathon. And I was like, <laughs> why can't I run a half marathon? I can't even run 200 meters. It just didn't work for my body. Running was one of those things that from almost the get-go, I just couldn't do. It just caused too much pain. So And that was different than previous pregnancies, right? No, they were Not about so the much. same. Okay. Um, and I think something that was different for me than maybe other people, I don't know. Um, I Pregnancy was very painful for me. Um, it, I didn't have a lot of problems, but it was painful by the end of both or all three of my pregnancies. I could barely walk. I was convinced that I was going to have permanent pelvic damage. There was something wrong. I just had, you know, all three of my kids were over eight pounds. I'm not very tall. I don't have a very big torso. There's just a lot of babies sitting in there. So when I give birth all three times, I was like, oh, I feel relief almost. Um, and so I just feel so much better even in those first couple of weeks of postpartum than I ever did being pregnant. And I know that that's not the same for every woman. So I, I just feel like take your time, give yourself grace. It's exhausting. We're so tired. Um, just finding your 20 to 30 to 40 minutes of, you know, alone time, trying to get things done. Um, because the more you move to, the better you'll feel. I do believe that. And, you know, I'm not sure everyone's different. You know, like she said, everyone's life's different. Stressors are different. Schedules are different. So... You know, Justin, you said your wife's been out of the game of, of fitness for about a year. You know, I don't know if that was just voluntary or something happened and it was forced, you know, whatever it is. But there's also just a very logical progression that if, if you're in shape, then it's easier to come back from a week off than a month off. It's easier to come back from one month off than three months off. So point being, the longer you've been away, well, yes, the steeper the climb is. And so much like Emily's saying, give yourself grace. That climb is going to be steep. And just starting to put one foot forward, you're on the road. Don't be hard on yourself. Move your body. Disregard all of your old numbers. It doesn't matter what you used to deadlift, what you used to squat, what your hell in time used to be. We're talking about a year now after, after giving birth. Clean slate. Clean slate and just make smart decisions. Speaking about making smart decisions... You know, 
know where I'm going with this. So a couple of weeks ago, I participated in the Grace Challenge from Beyond the Whiteboard. <laughs> and so that was a couple of weeks ago, maybe 10 days ago or something, two weeks. And so Emily was only two weeks out from giving birth, starting to move her body, feeling good. And the problem with my wife, God bless her, I love her, but she's a little crazy, you know, former collegiate gymnast, games athlete. She's a little crazy in a good way, but crazy nonetheless. So she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I'm going to go out in the, in the garage and do grace. And she's like, well, maybe I should do that. I'm like, well, maybe you shouldn't. You're two weeks <laughs> You're two weeks after giving birth. I don't think that sounds like a good idea. We're just starting to get back in. We're not bringing intensity. We're scaling the loadings. But she's like, it's always been a good workout for me. I want to do grace. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to win this argument. So I said, roger that, dear. Went out into the, into the garage and she did a, a 159 grace. It was scaled. I did it at 85 pounds. Oh, 85 pounds instead of 95 pounds. So a huge scaling. You know, she's like, well, For the record, I am, I I am felt... two weeks out, so I'm going to be smart. Instead of doing it at 95 pounds, I'll do it at 85 pounds because that's smart. Minute 59. I felt very good. I didn't have any repercussions from that. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, too, and I, I, will, I need to say this, is... I, I'm not having any pelvic floor issues, and I think that's something that needs to be monitored and watched. You know, if you're starting back working out, and every time you do double unders, you're, you know, peeing your pants, that means you probably need to go backwards um, mm. because you don't want stuff like that to be a permanent problem. Um, that's why when we had those squat clean workouts, I did those very, uh, very light. I think I did 75 pounds, and that was plenty. Um, but I'm, you know, I think third time around, I know what I'm doing by this point, so I'm not having any of those issues. I felt fine on Grace. I just have to give her a hard time. It's my job. <laughs> I have to give her a hard time. Uh, okay, final question, and then we'll do the shout-outs, is from Amanda. Amanda N. Okay, here we go. It says, thanks for coming on. Let's see. Can you touch on coming back after giving birth? So we just covered that one, but now here are some new questions, new to Amanda's uh, question. Can you talk about how gymnastics helped you with CrossFit and fitness overall, but in a way that makes sense to a child? My daughter will be watching. She specifically asked me to post which is better, CrossFit or gymnastics. <laughs> also, despite having her back handspring down and back hip circles perfect, she is lacking when it comes to the splits, and she would like to know your best tricks for doing them. Coach says, her coach says if they don't have them all by the end of August, um, they'll have an all-day-long conditioning. So there's a couple parts to her question, so we'll start, we'll start chipping away at it. So let's see. Um, her, so her daughter wants to know, which is better, CrossFit or gymnastics? Oh, they're both so different, and they're both wonderful in different ways um you know I I think fondly back on my gymnastics years it was such a chunk of my life it was 18 years of my almost 40 ex years of existence on planet earth um there were some very hard and dark times um but I wouldn't change that and then CrossFit has been um fun and enjoyable and without all of the darkness that came along with gymnastics. I wish, however, that I had trained CrossFit while I was a gymnast because I think it would have just helped me so much more. I think about all the floor routines that I did that I crashed and burned on the last tumbling pass because I just wasn't there cardiovascularly yet or I just didn't have the leg strength. So I can only imagine the type of athlete I would have been if I had trained this way when I was, you know, especially a teenager. So if you have the ability to kind of incorporate some CrossFit workouts into your gymnastics life, what a fantastic athlete you will be, probably far above your peers as well. Our next part is, despite having her back handspring down and back hip circles perfect, she is lacking when it comes to the splits, and she would like to know if you have any tricks for doing them. Bear in mind... Coach says if they don't all have them by the end of August, they will have an all-day-long conditioning day. So, <laughs> flexibility is one of those things that some people are born with and some people are not. Um, 
And I think there's some stuff that you can do to get yourself more flexible, but I don't think that there's anything that you can do to make yourself, say, a nasty Eliukin. She was born that way. She has flexibility that way that other people just simply will not have. I was not a flexible gymnast. I struggled on my splits as well. Um, I had to really fight for all of my leaps to get to 180. I was never the athlete that could go above 180. Um, so you might just have to change some of your skills that you're working on as well. For example, people who are watching this have no idea what gymnastics, they're going to be like, what are you talking about? But I trained a Tkachev for three years. It was horrible. It was awful. I was not flexible enough to do it. I landed on the high bar more times than I can even count. And so I finally found my voice and said, I'm not doing this skill anymore. And I went on to do gingers instead because it was easier and it didn't require the flexibility. I never could do front aerials on beam. It was just never going to happen for me. I didn't have that kind of uh, flexibility in my back. I wasn't even great uh, back tumbler on balance beam, so I turned everything into a round off. I did round off folds. I did round off layouts. Um, so I had to adapt for my lack of flex flexibility. And you might be one of those athletes, so you can stretch a lot. You can practice a lot. Uh, my guess is it's probably not from lack of effort. If it is, and you're maybe skipping those, uh, start doing them more often. But if you're working your tail off and trying and stretching, I don't know. I am of the opinion that some of that stuff you just can't develop. And, and you're talking to an athlete who we used to have to sit in the middle splits with 25 pound plates on our butts. And sometimes our coaches would come on and step on top of us. So, you know, that, that abusive era, uh, we would overstretch. You'd put your hand or your legs up on the panel mats and have a coach like pull on your back and push you down. And I still wasn't very flexible. So I, the I don't, people who showed up flexible stayed flexible. And the people who Some are middle of the road stayed middle of the born road. Born that way. And I think, you know, if we talk Olympics again, go watch the difference between Suni Lee and Jade Carey. Jade Carey is not that flexible. She Her gymnastics looks very different than Suni Lee's. Suni Lee is very bendy, um, or even Grace McCallum. It just comes very easily to them. My guess is they walked into a gym already flexible. Whereas someone like... It's not like um, that other gymnast hasn't been busting her butt. Right. She's at the Jay Olympics. Curry just doesn't... It hurt. Her, it just looks different. And so I, I would imagine her skills are different. She chose to do different things. Um, I don't know if that, that answer is helpful. Well, if she doesn't get them, she's going to pay the man. We've got an, an, an all-day conditioning <laughs> session is going to happen in August if these skills don't happen. So that's one of those things that I have to say is like the old-school regimens. Like... How do you tell an athlete you have to do this if they're not able to, and then they're going to be punished if they cannot? Um, as a parent, I'd be I'd be stepping in and having a conversation with that coach to be just really candid and honest. Old school. Okay, and then final paragraph says, I know you're a gymnast. What do you think of gymnastics now and how it has shaped you as a person in terms of focus and discipline would you change anything? And what made you choose gymnastics in the first place? Yeah. Um, it, it obviously taught me the art of perfection. I have been a perfectionist since I was little. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. And I also don't know if that was my personality and then it just um, was highlighted through gymnastics or if, if that's what developed um, while doing the sport. I started so young. I was four. Um, and so it has made me always in my life, everything I go out and do, I want to do to perfection. Um, and I have a really high work ethic. I am able to grind. Um, you know, I, unlike, I think some of my peers, uh, and I don't, some of that, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Again, I was in a, an era where you just kind of sucked it up, shut your mouth and kept going, uh, and some of that kind of carries over to today, I think, and I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I don't know. Does that answer Would the question? Would you change anything? Would I change? No. Even all of the hard stuff, I wouldn't change it. It has shaped who I am. 
I think we go through trials in life and we come out on the other end stronger. Um, we've learned life lessons, learned things from that. So to go back and kind of erase that would essentially change everything about who I am. Uh, so I wouldn't go back and change anything. Perfect. Okay. Hope that hope that helps. That was the final question. And now just some house cleaning here at the end. I'm going to slip out because our daughter is awake. Oh, all right. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much. See you in a bit. Today is Thursday. Tomorrow I get on a plane on Friday, take a red eye out to Madison. I will be at Madison at the games all day on Saturday, and then I'm heading back home on Sunday again because we have a newborn baby in the house. I will be putting out on the Facebook group where I'm at, so hopefully I can link up with any linchpin people that are there on site. I also have been asked to speak as part of the CrossFit Health Chronic Disease Panel, and that's happening at 1 p.m. on Saturday on, I believe, the demo stage in Vendor Village, I, I believe, is where that's taking place. But it'll be myself, two physicians, and then a woman named Athena Perez, who has uh, a personal triumph and success story of battling through chronic disease using CrossFit and now substantially having improved her life. So the physicians will be speaking to that side. She'll be speaking to the, to the having lived it side. Then I'll be discussing more of the training, programming, coaching kind of aspect for that segment of society. So it should be cool. And then now, oh, so next week also my family is in town. They're coming out to see the baby. So there might not be an Ask Me Anything next week because I'll have some family in town. We'll see. TBD. Maybe we will. We'll play it by ear. Let's end with the linchpin shoutouts. So again, thanks, Kelly, for bringing these to my attention. We've got four of them. So the first one, this is from Christian D. And I entitled this one, No Excuses. So they wrote, busy last couple of days, felt stagnant. It's 11 p.m. and both kids are asleep. Got in a quick workout before bed. They did 100 push-ups, 100 sit-ups, and 100 air squats at 11 p.m. Because that's the only time they could. That is some serious commitment, discipline, and mental fortitude. So good on you. Just did not, didn't choose to have an excuse. All right, next one. From DeWald W. Says, hey, Lynchpin family. It's been a hectic week at work and at home. Our 18-month-old daughter has not been sleeping so well. My wife is 39 weeks pregnant, so we've both been up a lot but still managed to do all the workouts this past week. Wasn't excited for today's workout, but decided just to see how it'd feel after the warm-up. My plan was to move steady, and that's exactly what they did. Good day in the gym, and just thanks to the Lynchman community for the support. So again, another story of just making it happen, modifying if need be, and leaning on the Lynchman community. It makes me very happy. Third one, from Cameron V., this is from a nasty workout that we did. There was six, nine, twelve, nine, six of a burpee, a heavy front squat, and a pull-up. Cameron said, did the hardest movement today, which was taking weight off the barbell part way through the workout, which I think is fantastic. He says, did some warm-up squats at 135, which felt not great, scaled down to 115. After the round of nine, my hamstrings just didn't feel right. Dropped the squat weight down to 95 pounds. He says it's very hard to reject ego and scale, but things weren't feeling great. And now he made an excellent decision. That removing of ego that we talk about all the time at Lynchpin, it's easy to say, it's hard to do, and it warms my heart when people make those tough decisions. So good on you. Final one from Rick H. Rick says, let's see, I just entitled this one Lynchpin Community. It says, perfect workout for this morning. Uh, turned it up to the right intensity. Good start to the day. Side note, this is from Rick. I posted some photos from a hospital on my private, you know, excuse me, not private, personal Instagram today. So Rick didn't post those in the Facebook group. He posted them on his Instagram page. 
Uh, some people from this group follow me there. My wife was having her gallbladder removed. I posted these pics without much context. The amount of messages I got from the linchpin community with concern and well wishes was actually more than the people I know in quote-unquote real life. Thanks to all who messaged me or commented. It's amazing how awesome this community is. And just so you know, everything went fine. So how cool is that? And that speaks to... Don't get me wrong. I want everybody to get wonderfully fit. Long-term health and fitness. That's the goal. You can do that on your own. You know? Post the workouts for free every day on Lynchpin. But the community aspect of what happens in the private track... I know that word community gets thrown around so much these days that it actually can just seem like fluff and everybody's saying it. We truly have created an actual community of caring people from all around the globe. It it boggles my mind, the warmth and support that I see on a daily basis in the group. Human kindness at its best. So please keep it up. All of you are fantastic. Hope you enjoyed the Ask Me Anything, and I'm going to go help my wife with our little baby. Have a good day.